Okay, so thank you for joining us for research data management for images. Um, who are we? I'm Elisa. I'm the research data management specialist at the McGill Library, and I'm joined by Marcella e. sister, who is the coordinator for the Digital Scholarship Hub at the library as well. So uh, before we start, I think Marcella had sent um, in the email uh, reminding about the session a link for Tropy to download it and install it. So if you want to follow along on the interactive part of this workshop, just make sure that you have it that downloaded and installed. Um, and you'll also need the image data set that we will be working with um, for that portion of this workshop. Um, I will be uh, putting them, putting both links in the chat right now. I'm not, we're not expecting you to know them, but I will be putting a link to Tropy and the link to the data set in the chat in a second. Okay, cool. So those links will be in the chat. Um, you know, if you want to go ahead and download those before that section, that'll be the second half of the workshop. Um, and just another note that this workshop will be recorded and posted to the Digital Scholarship Hub YouTube channel, uh, and we can stop the recording before the question period. And okay, so what we'll cover in this session, we'll do a little bit of background about research data management um, and some key concepts related to research data management. If you've been in any of my workshops this year, there will be some overlap, but this is a more tailored workshop for images and image data. Um, we'll talk about why researchers should care about data management for images, and then some practical tips and um, uh, uh, some practices that you can use for dealing with images um, if, you if you're collecting images for your data. And then Marcella will do a demo and um, an interactive um, demo with Tropy that you can follow along with as well. Um, and please uh, stop us if you have any questions. And for those of you who just joined us, this session is recorded. We will stop it um before the question period and uh, marcella will maybe you can re put the links back in the chat because i think a couple people just joined um for downloading trophy and data set that we'll be using so what is research data management um so it concerns how you create or collect data and that includes image data so data sets that contain images um and those can be digital or analog uh, it's, it concerns how you plan for the use of those data, how you organize, structure, and name the data. So if you have digital data, how are you naming those files, especially if each file, let's say, is an image? Um, how do you know what's in that file? Um, where you keep it, how you make it secure. So depending on what kind of images you're collecting, if it includes health information, for example, like if it's a scan of someone's brain that includes you know, some information like their name or a patient ID, how are you making it secure? How are you providing access to that, to those images, to people who should have access? How are you preventing access from people who should not have access? Um, where you're storing it, how you're backing it up, how you process data. And so with image data, that tends to be more unique in this sort of processing and sharing phase because it's not like numeric data where you can just say my data set is a CSV and it contains a column that has temperature. With an image, you know, you have to describe it in a way that people can find it. You have to process it in a way that it can be analyzed and it's more complex, right? It, it has a lot of elements to it. Um, and then you have to think about can, I, can the images that I've collected or that I've used for my research be reused by others? So first of all, did you collect, are they original research? Did you collect them yourselves? Do you have ownership over those images? And can you sort of dictate the terms for reuse? Like, can you just license them broadly? Do you want to do that? Um, and then, you know, secondly, if you got those images from another database, what are the terms and conditions for the use from that database from where you received them? Um, and so in terms of like, what do we mean by images as research data? So this can cover many different disciplines. Um, I think that, you know, um, the sort of classic um, idea about like an image is that it's just a digitized photograph or, uh, you know, a letter or artwork or something like that. But it's really ubiquitous across many fields. So there's microscopy images. So people who use microscopes who take images. Um, there's that type of data. Sorry, there's someone, I think, chopping a tree down or something in the, <laughs> the back of my house. Sorry for the, the ambient noise. Uh, maps. So if you work with digital maps or cartography or um, 
GIS, you'll have a lot of, you might have a lot of image data that are layered, that are vectorized, for example. Um, you might be producing just figures for your journal articles or posters. So those are images as well. They're maybe not part of the data set itself, but they portray data, right? So visualizations of data. Um, and you might have drawn images, you might have neuroimaging data, so brain scans. Um, is there anything else that anyone works with that uh, are types of images that you collect for your research that don't fit into any of these categories that are listed here? You can put it in the chat if you don't wanna talk, just out of curiosity. Okay, looks like that cover is most Oh, herbarium specimens. Interesting. Yes. So yeah, you have mounted herbarium specimens. I always forget about the plants, but that's true. Um, and that kind of creates a whole, a very interesting, you know, ability for researchers across the world to work with data sets that are about very local physical things that normally, you know, before we had um, the ability to digitize, you know, you couldn't share them. So we can define data as like anything that you're using that's like a collection of information that you're basing some conclusion in a paper on or that you're using to answer a research question, right? So it's like evidence that you're using to answer, to make some claims about something. Um, and in the digital humanities sense, this could be digitized, you know, text. These could be a corpus of like text, for example. Uh, does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Um, fine. I, I'm just gonna move on. I don't want to get into a whole like debate about what is the data, what is the definition of data. But um, thank you for that comment. Um, but it, it depends on the discipline you're in in terms of like what you think of as data. It can be defined a bit more loosely in certain fields than other fields. So thinking about the life cycle of image data. Um, so you, as I had mentioned, you have sort of a, a whole cycle. So it's not just a linear process necessarily. It starts with creating or collecting images. You have to process them in some way, analyze them, preserve them. Um, give access to those images and then potentially allow for their reuse. And then you might start that project all over again, either with the same collection of images or with a new collection of images. So, you know, if you're doing research as part of your career, as your work, this might be an ongoing cycle um, that repeats itself a lot. So why should we care about managing images and managing data um, that contain images or image data sets? Um, it's useful, so having some kind of organization scheme makes you more efficient. Um, it saves you time at the end of your project when you're trying to archive something or figure out, you know, in your analysis how to use the images that you've collected. Um, some journals or a lot of journals, potentially, depending on what discipline you're in, are requiring that data sets are made available following the publication of um, the project. Um, and in that case, you would have to probably think in advance about how to prepare those data so that they could, you could meet that mandate. Um, it plays into also open science and reproducibility, which is not something that's a model that makes sense for every discipline, but in the disciplines that have a norm of sharing data to um, ensure reproducibility of research, uh, it's very important to sort of set data up in a way that it can be um, you know, pro, you know, findable to other researchers and it can be reused. Um, and there will be requirements from funders um, to eventually have a plan for data, potentially with images and potentially have to deposit the data if it's not sensitive in some way. These are coming down the pipeline. They're getting phased in over the next few years. Um, but there are many international funding agencies currently that do have um, requirements for sharing data at the end of a research project. Okay, so what are some ways we can practice good data management? Um, so essentially with images, I think it's really important to have a good structure of folders of how the images are being stored. So you, here's like a very classic um, structure. It doesn't really necessarily have to do with images or not, but it's the idea conceptually of having, you know, your project or if you're working as part of a group or a lab, then maybe that highest level folder is just your name. Um, and then you have some subfolders where you try to move your data around based on the stage that it's at. So you have some like raw instruments, like, you know, how are you collecting the images? 
Um, do you have some documentation about them that you need to maintain? Um, then you have your folder of data where you have raw images. So the raw data that you've collected, just the, the initial format, the initial image that you collect. And then you might want to move them into another folder when you're processing them to sort of make sure that you have a sort of trail of what you've done to the images over iterations of processing or analyzing them. And then ideally you would have at the end a sort of research outputs folder or like a paper or a poster folder where the data that underlies that paper or poster can, is contained in the same folder. So if someone asks you for that data, you know, I read your paper and I want the data, I want to either reproduce it or can I reuse the data for something else that you know exactly where it is. It's in that folder that has the paper um, that it relates to, or it's in a repository somewhere and it's available, right? So one or the other, um, ideally both. This is not to say that there's like a perfect way to set up um, a folder structure. So you can, here's a couple examples of different ways of thinking about it. So in one way, it's by type of file. And in another way, it's by the, like setting up the, the folders based on the paper itself. So I'm producing a figure, it needs code, it needs data, um, and it has some results. So I'm going to have a folder just for that one figure for that output that's part of the article, for example. Um, and here's an example of the BIDS, the Brain Imaging Data Structure, um, which is a standard for um, structuring data that come from MRI machines that are, you know, brain imaging scans. So this is one standard. It's not like the only one necessary, but it was. It's just to show an example that there are discipline-specific fields um, that work with images that have developed their own standards for working with it based on the type of file and the instruments that collect the data, right? So um, it's worth noting in your field or discipline, is there a way that, you know, a standard that people are using so that if I release my data to someone, they're gonna expect that it's in this format um, or in this structure. Okay, so we're gonna do a little exercise and try to name this, full, this image. I'm going to give you a link in the chat um, and just a warning in advance that I am doing a study on this exercise. So I'm doing my own research. Um, so if you don't want to consent to it, that's totally fine. For the folks that do, we'll take a look. Um, it's anonymized. There will be a page that you get to. There's a couple pages. You have to read the consent form and accept. It's basically we're trying to see how people name this file. Um, that's it <laughs> for um, our own study. And then you'll get to a page that will say, stop, don't close your browser and leave the page open. That's because we have a second part of the exercise itself. Um, so when you get to that point, if you could just stop, that would be great. Um, and I'll give you a chance to do that. And we and I will pull the, emit the responses without any, it's an, totally anonymized. So we'll take a look at the how people are gonna name their files and then we'll have a quick discussion about that. Let me know if anyone has any issues with that link. Or any questions about that? And for the person in the chat, I'll come back to your question about the data at the end. Yes, it is a super cute dog. Very good comment. <laughs> uh, this is our colleague, our former colleague's dog that we are, you know, using in perpetuity. So I'm waiting for at least a couple of responses. Um, if there are none, we will try something else. Okay, um, 
So if you want to put your responses in the chat instead of the form, that's also okay. So I'm going to wait. So put like the actual name of how you would name the file. Like think about how you would actually name the file. Okay, so like Chopin underscore toy dot JPEG, <laughs> Chopin underscore July 22, Chopin underscore dog underscore slipper, dog carrying slipper, dog underscore Chopin toy underscore 1207 22. And 2022-07-12 Chopin slipper. Okay, awesome. So these are all good and all different, which is really interesting, right? So everyone would name the file in a different way. Um, and it all more or less has something descriptive in it. Um, so now I'm gonna show you um, some information about sort of best practices for file naming. And it's, and it's really important with images as well, just because, um, you know, it's not like, like the image contains something that like you're deciding how to describe it. So you wanna definitely have the date of the file creation. Um, and typically you wanna use this year, month, date standard. Um, so it's like an international standard 8601 for dates. And it's because it works well in a variety of like data analysis software, that date format. Um, so that's the international standard for dates, um, the year, month, date with the four digits for the year and two for the month and date. You would want an acronym for your project. So if you're only working on one project, you maybe want to can forego that. But if you're working on several projects or it might be one aspect of a project, maybe you want an acronym so you know what it relates to. Um, if you're in a team or a group and multiple people are collecting data, you want to make sure you put your initials. Um, so if you're just doing a solo research project, it's less important. But if you're working with a team, um, you want to make sure it's clear who, who collected that data or who contributed that, that file. Um, the subject, so here's where it could be like Chopin slipper, Chopin toy dog, you know, all of those kinds of things. You might want to condense it to something or have a um, method for sh using shorthand for describing the subjects. And you would want versions in the case that you saved it in different ways or cropped it or something like that or did other kinds of work to it. You would want to make sure you version it um, so that you know which version of the file it is, if it's the original one or if it's one further down along the line in the processing pipeline. So let's try this again. I'm going to give you more information. And when you have an idea, go ahead and again type in like the file name, the name way you would name the file into the chat. Okay, so we have someone using, oh, no, that was already there. <laughs> so given this information, when you're ready, go ahead and try again, type into the chat uh, the name of the file. And it can be the same one you put before. I'm not saying that like anyone was wrong or right, just uh, if this information helps you name it in a different way, you could try. I'm gonna wait for at least a couple of responses. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, we have the date today, we have RDM, so like from the workshop, we have initials, and we have Chopin version one. Great, any other suggestions? So we have the date of the, the photo was taken, 2018, August 5th, in the year month date, Chopin version one again. Great suggestion. 
Let's try for one more. Anyone else want to contribute one? And we have another one with the date of the photo was taken, BW as in like black and white, Chopin version one. So the interesting thing here, there's a couple interesting things here. First, that we all saw a list of standards for and best practices for naming files. And yet here we have like three different names of the same file, right? With the same information. So the, the point here being that people will really have a subjective way of describing images. And if you were, if you want someone else to come in and understand, or if in a few years you wanna go back to your data set and understand what the images are, you have to have some documentation somewhere that explains what your logic was in naming that file in that way, right? Like what does the acronym means? What do the subjects mean? What does BW mean? Like maybe you get it now that it's black and white, but in a few years, maybe you won't remember that you had a collection of photos and some were in black and white and some were in color, for example. Um, does it matter that it's a Polaroid? Does it matter that it was taken in Toronto? Um, some of these things might matter, some might not, and it depends on the project that you're doing and the research that you're doing, right? And so that has to be documented somewhere. And ideally, you know, thinking about other people coming in and just looking at a list of files that you have, and you say, this is the data that I based my research off of, and they see a file that says 2018 Chopin, um, is that a, you know, Chopin is also the name of a composer. So how do we know it's a dog? Um, is it important that we know it's a dog? You know, so these are the kinds of questions that you want to ask yourself. And I saw a hand being raised. Um, I'm going to remind you, we are recording. If, you if you're fine with that and you want to ask your question out loud, that's also fine. If you want to type it into the chat, that's fine too. Um, so thank, go you. Ahead. Thank, thank you so much. I decided I would just save my question for later if there's time. Okay. Uh, and it, but thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, but go, yeah, go ahead. Well, we should have time for questions. Um, but anyway, so the point here being that even when you have standards um, for how to name a file, you can still have a different subjective opinion, like perspective on how to name something. So it's important to document that. Um, so just a quick overview, you want to add enough information to uniquely identify the image, can include the date, the version, the author, you could add a pseudonym, a topic, or a location for context, depends on the research itself and what's important. Um, you're trying to use the year, month, date in, to, in order to sort your um, images as well, so if they all have dates on them in the same um, format and the same standard, then you can sort them as a list so you can get them in chronological order. Um, and you want to avoid special characters. You don't want to have spaces in your file names. You want to try to use underscores or hyphens to separate um, any of these aspects of the file name. And that's because some computational systems and programs, they don't read spaces. So if you work in GIS, for example, you probably already know this, like don't put a period in anything, in any variable name or file name because um, the software gets really mad about that. Um, so just something to be aware of as well. Um, and just thinking about the order of how you name the file kind of affects how you can sort on those data. So if you do it by date, you can sort it chronologically. If you name them with the type first, and this is in any kind of basic operating system, computer folder system that you might be working with, um, not necessarily in an analytical software system, but you know, just looking at a folder with your files. So by subject, it could be, or you could do forced ordering with numbers. So in some Microsoft systems, um, it'll alphabetize files no matter what you do. Um, but the way to get around that is to force order it by putting numbers at the beginning of the files. Um, so if you wanted it by order of like when the files were created, for example, then you could do that in that kind of system. Um, and a note about preservation file formats. So if you're thinking about like, I'll have to share my data at the end of my project, or I wanna have an archival version of my data that's not dependent on specific software, um, then you wanna think about maintaining a copy that's a preservation file format. And we will share the slides to this so you'll get the links that are included in the slides. Um, there's a couple links that um, like have a list of sustainability formats. Um, but just in general, I put some of the few that relate to like the type of image data that people typically collect. So like microscopy images can be saved as a TIFF file, um, not in the proprietary software file that comes from um, the, the collection instrument. Um, raster maps or georeferenced images or rasters in general can be saved as a PDF. I know it's not an image file, but it can be saved that way. Or a geotiff um, is the preservation format. 
for vector maps um, or vector images. So here you do, there is a, a proprietary software version. So Esri shape files are proprietary to the Esri Corporation, um, but it's the one that's used the most and it can be opened in the open source alternative software to ArcGIS software. So that one is fine, even though it's proprietary, um, but you could also consider a GeoJSON file. For neuroimaging data, there's um, the Nifty or DICOM file formats. And then for all other kind of digitized or digital images, there's a sort of four main ones that we typically save in, which is TIFF, JPEG, JPEG 2000 and the PNG format. Um, so you just also want to consider like what's really important about the preservation of your images. Is it important to maintain the resolution and to not lose any, you know, um, to not lose any data or um, resolution when you might resave it or, you know, um, compress it or, you know, analyze it in different kinds of systems. So you might want to avoid lossy formats like JPEG. Um, you might be collecting a lot of large images, in which case you might want to think of storing them in compressed or archival um, folder systems like a zip um, archive. Um, and in general, it is much more difficult to deal with large number of large image files. So lossy formats are ones that sort of like every time you resave or convert it or change the size or the aspect ratio, it can lose some resolution, essentially. So depending on you know, whether that really is important to maintain like very high resolution of images, you would go to a TIFF format, if you, which is a not lossy format. Um, but they're harder to work with because they're larger in size. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, and then the last couple notes about metadata and documentation, and this is gonna play into the Tropy um, demo that Marcella is gonna do. Um, but metadata, and I think actually this goes back to the question that someone had about two types of data, but there are the research data themselves, and then there are data about data or metadata. Um, and in a, metadata essentially enables others to understand the data. So it's information about your image itself. So even the file name of your image is metadata, right? Because it can tell you something about that. And for images, metadata is super, super crucial. Like it is the, one of the most crucial things to consider because if you think about when you're searching for images in just a general search engine like Google image or um, art store or something like that, how do you find the images? How do you know the images contain something like an image of a girl or an image of a dog or it's black and white? Someone or an AI, but it's normally someone is describing that image and it, they're putting keywords or they're putting like tags on the image and they're using ones that are standardized so that like, you know, humans, when they think of how to describe what they want to retrieve from a system, will be able to find that image. But that's very difficult with images because they can have a lot of different information. They can have different things stored in pixels. They can have colors that are like, you know, depending on what you're researching, you might be looking for images that are that have some content or are a certain color or are, you know, have a certain resolution and you need to be able to search on that or query on that kind of criteria, which means someone has to add that metadata to the image itself, right? Um, so just something to think about that that's what makes it really hard to archive and share images is that there's a lot of work that goes into producing metadata. But if you can produce a separate data set that has a lot of information about each of your images, and that could go, like sort of be linked to them, then it would make it much easier in a database to find the ones that you're looking for. And there are certain standardized metadata schemes that have been sort of like, they're not designed specifically for images. So there's DDI, um, which is a social science, a sort of general social science um, metadata schema. And it includes things like who's the author of the, the image or the file or the data set. Um, where was it collected? What was the date of the collection? You know, so some pretty general things like some keywords, what's the discipline it's related to. Um, but it can fit images. You can sort of make it fit images in that case, even though it isn't designed for that. And then there are some specific ones for very specific types of images. So for geographic information, there's an international standard ISO 19115. Um, and most GIS software can produce a compliant metadata file in that format. So that's getting a bit technical, but all this to say is that if you're thinking about sharing it down the line or you want it to be in a database where people can find the Im individual image files, 
um, it has to be described very, very well, and it has to be described in a way that's standardized across systems, right? Um, and so other things to think about that Marcella will talk about as well are alt text, so descriptions of images for um, folks that are visually impaired or can't like, you know, see the actual image itself, but would be able to understand what's in the image through a textual description of it. Um, a documentation called a readme file, so that's where you would have like a, you know, some information about why did you choose your file naming convention? How, what are the acronyms in your file naming convention? What do the initials stand for in your file naming convention? Um, and you would want to think about a license or a data use agreement. So like if you want to release your image data in the future in a repository, what can people do with it? Do they have to cite you? Can they change the images? Can they, you know, use it for commercial purposes? Can they use it for, you know, so thinking about how can people use that later and what you want you know, them to acknowledge if they reuse your data. Um, so we'll do a two, super short exercise and then I'm going to go through the next stuff pretty quickly and turn it over to Marcella. Um, but consider this data set. So this is not an image data set. This is like an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file. It's comma delimited. So the top row has like the names of the variables, name, size, res created. What do you think um, those headers stand for? Like, what do you think is contained in each column? And you can pick one or all of them um, and put it in the chat if you want to. Oh, and for the question, is there no universally best format? Um, there's some universal metadata um, um, Components like knowing who the author was of something, knowing you know when it was collected, the date, knowing what instrument was used to collect it. So there's some there's some you know things that you should contain no matter what kind of data you're working with, um, but it it can really depend on what your discipline is. So it's usually that there are discipline specific standards or data type specific standards, depending on if it comes from a microscope or an MRI machine or something like that. Um, so for these, this uh, data set, does anyone want to try to guess what does res mean, for example, or created? All right, we have a group that's done with guessing. Um, resolution, yes. Okay, so we could guess it's resolution. But we only know that because we know it's maybe an image data set. And I've said the word resolution like five times already, potentially. Um, or you work with images, so you know. But do we know what it's measured in the resolution? Is it PPI, DPI? We don't know because it's not there. Um, the date it was created is maybe that date in the last column. Again, like we could probably figure out the size is the size of the image. The name is the name of an image, potentially. Um, if you looked at the data set that Marcella is going to have you work with, um, you'll maybe recognize some of these names. Um, but the point here being that it's not just enough to have the file with the information. You have to have some documentation explaining like what are each of these things um, and how were they measured and what unit were they measured in, right? Okay, so a couple of quick last things just for thinking about storage, preservation, and backups. So you want to have ideally three backups um, on two different storage mediums, one off-site where you are. Two, I would say, is good enough normally if they're on different locations, like if they're not both in the same place. Um, so if you use Microsoft products through McGill, like SharePoint or Teams or OneDrive to store your data, that has two separate, or I think even three separate backups, two of them are in different locations. So it already kind of checks this box, just so that you know that. Um, and then things to consider with images, you can start to end up needing a lot of storage and a lot of space for computing or analyzing images, um, especially if they're large files. Um, so you might want to consider the resources that are offered for free to researchers here at McGill. So that would be Teams or SharePoint. So each team or SharePoint site can give you 25 terabytes of storage. Um, and right now you can have an unlimited number of each of those. So something to be aware of. Uh, there's also Calcul Quebec as part of the Compute Canada networks. So they have high performance computing clusters and you can request an allocation for storage there if you need more robust storage. Um, 
And then there's a question. If you're working with hundreds of images, where do you recommend storing? Depending on what type of file format and what size, I would say maybe Teams actually or SharePoint. Um, that should be fine for most cases. Um, no problem. And I, I, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'll explain like how do you request a SharePoint site? Um, the teams you have access to, you should have access to. Um, so just a, a list of questions to think about. One more, I'm gonna do one more slide, Marcel, and then I'm gonna hand it over to you, <laughs> okay? And then thinking about sharing your data at the end of the research um, project. Um, so there's general repositories. We have an institutional repository, the McGill Dataverse, um, which can store five, there's just a, cap on each, an individual file has to be three gigabytes or smaller. So in some cases, like for neuroimaging data, that tends to be like a limit that is, isn't gonna work for that kind of data. But I, we do have a lot of GIS and mapping data that um, is in the Dataverse, so something to consider. Um, there's general repositories, and then there's domain specific ones for like, there's some for neuroimaging, some for microscopy data. And thinking about, again, a reminder to think about metadata and the readme file. And I will skip this license part and skip this and go over to Marcella. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Marcella. No, thank you, Alyssa. You you had to, you still had two minutes. You were, we, we oh, I have two minutes. I'm just gonna say about licenses. If you're interested in licensing your data after you're finished using it, you can contact me and I will help you <laughs> figure out which license to use. Okay, now now I'm done. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna move it so we are gonna be looking at my screen. If my screen wants to, um, there we go. So yeah, so we're gonna go talk about, talk about Tropy. I'm just gonna send you on the chat once again. I'm gonna send the links for Tropy and for the data set. If you didn't get them before, um, you can do it. We will be moving on, so we don't have time to wait for you to install everything like that. But just so that you have them. The other thing I want to mention is we provide the data set just so that you have something to work. If you want to use your own images. That's totally fine. Um, I don't care what you're doing. If you have two or three images, you will be more than fine and you're able to follow along. So don't feel like you need to use our images. But if you want to look at some really fun academic library, um, academic conference memes, then um, feel free to, to look at that because I spent some time uh, collecting them. So I'm just going to send those links again. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm on a new setup, so I hope everything is okay. Um, and also, you're going to see a lot of my profile because I'm on two screens. But I'm going to go to about Tropy, um, which is a, quite a nifty tool that I discovered uh, a couple of months ago that helps you um, organize images and manage your research images. So what is Tropy? <laughs> so Tropy is software that allows you to organize and describe your research images. It does not store your images. Your images will not be on. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. There we go. I'm just gonna tap my my microphone into my mask. So Tropy does not store your images. Your images will still live somewhere else on an, like either on your computer or on the cloud or wherever you want to keep them. Um, at least I see expert on where you should keep them. Um, but Tropy does not store your images. It just stores the metadata, the information about those images that you are going to create. Um, as I say here, the, as a user of Tropy, you can add metadata, you can describe your images, you can do some minor edits on your images, you can create lists, which are sort of like groups, and you can add tags and a few other things that we will look at in a minute. Um, one of the great things about Tropy is that your projects are fully searchable. So it searches all the metadata that you add to your uh, to your images so that you can pull things up pretty quickly. Um, and the projects can be exported in a variety of formats. Sometimes they're just built in and sometimes you just have to download a plugin. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. The Unfortunately, Tropy does not have a collaboration feature just yet. It seems something that they're very aware of because um, it was very clear on their um, message. Sorry, I just see that there's a few share questions. Um, Okay, we'll, we'll continue. We will take a look at that later. So they don't have a collaboration feature yet, but I think it's something they're working and they're keenly aware that people would like, but just something to keep in mind. So a few Tropy terms before we actually 
go into Tropy. Um, so the first one is your project. Your project will be your data, your data set. So they're called projects. Um, the individual images, they call them items. The they have something called lists, which are basically folders or groups of images. And then the last one, they have tags that, you know, subject headings, tags, hashtags, anything like that. Um, that's what they refer to. So we are going to go to Tropy. Uh, and I'm just gonna make sure that like you are seeing what I'm hoping that you are seeing. So just in case, I'm gonna do that. And um, when you open Tropy, it's gonna look a little bit different for me than for you if it's the first time you're opening it because the first time you open it is gonna ask you um, to name a project. I already have projects, so it's not gonna ask me to do that but we're gonna do it together and I'll show you exactly what it shows. So I'm opening my Tropy. As you can see, I have a project already open, but let's say I wanted to create a new project and this is what you're going to see. If you go to new and project, you should probably be seeing this window on your computer. Um, if you, this is the first time you're opening it, all you need to do is name your project um, and then click on create project and you will have a project on Tropy. That's that's how easy it is. Um, you can have multiple projects. Um, you don't have to worry about it. Then, once we have our projects, which is great, we the first thing we need to do is populate a project or our, add our data to a project. There's a couple of ways to do this, or actually there's two. The first one is the old drag and drop. So um, while I'm talking, feel free to do it or to try it. If not, we can try the um, the other one, which is Again, fairly easy, go to file, and then you would go to import. And it's gonna ask for photos or folders. So for photos, it would be individual images. And for folders, it would be like, if you wanna move an, an, an entire folder. Now, one thing that's important to know is Tropy doesn't respect fi file folder structure, which means that if you have folders within folders, it's not going to respect the structure or the hierarchy. What's gonna happen is like, you're just gonna see a list of images and that's gonna be it. It's just not going to um, respect it. You're gonna have to build lists or, or groups if you want to, to do that later. So just know that, that once you move things into Tropy, it will all be at the same level. There will not be hierarchies of things, or at least just yet. So I'm gonna give you maybe 30 seconds to um, add some images, whatever you want to your trophy, just so that we can, you know, test a few things. So what I'm going to ask is if you can um, to maybe show me a thumbs up or something or any kind of, or put on the chat that you have done it just so that we know that we can uh, keep moving. So I see one, I see one thumbs up. And I do encourage you to look at my memes, they're hilarious. Um, so I have some fun. Okay, so I'm hoping that most of you will have um, added some images. If not, it's fine, you can just do it as I'm talking. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be the data set that we send. It can be whatever is that you wanna add, if you wanna use your own images or anything like that. But your trophy should be looking like similar to what I have, except you probably you won't have these red dots here. We're gonna talk about what those are in a minute. But you're gonna look and this is what your um your this is your what your project view looks like. So you have a left pane with image your project title and then it says lists and then tags. You have your middle pane where you have all your images and then you have a pane on the right that says metadata and tags. To me, it's also very reminiscent if you've ever used a note or Zotero, um, it's kind of follows that similar like interface structure. Um, so if you've used that, it, this might actually be uh, a good transition and something that you'll be uh, able to, you know, get a hand on uh, pretty quickly. On your project view, you can change the way you see it. So right now I'm seeing it as a list, but if I move, this bar here on the top, I'm able to change the size and I can see the images um, and they go from like a list all the way to like really big images. So you can really do 
whatever you want. Uh, one last thing I do before we're going to start talking metadata and showing you how you can do that is, let's say you um, scanned a lot of things. Um, and some of the scans that you have are all of the same item. Let's say you scanned a letter or you digitize a letter and you have it all in different folders, but you want to put it in one folder all together. You can merge your files into a bigger file. So all you would need to do is you select the files that you like or that you want to join. And then you right click, or if you're on a Mac, you should be, you know, the command click. And then there should be an option to merge the selected items. And that way you can put them all into one file as opposed to separate files. Okay, so let's talk metadata. One of the great things that you can do with Tropy is that you can add metadata to your files. Um, you can do this from the product view or from the item view. I'm gonna show you now on the item view just because I wanna show you some things and some features, but then, oh, sorry, from the project view because I wanna show you some, some features, um, but just know that you can always do it from the item view, which we'll look at in a second. Um, so when I click on any of my, let's make this panel a little bit bigger so you can see it better. When I click on any of my images, I'm gonna see the metadata. Right now it's very scarce because I didn't add a lot of metadata to anything when I created the file. I have the Tropy photo metadata. This is like Tropy will just add it automatically um, and it has the size information, the file name, the date it was created, um, the title, which you can change, um, the date added and the date modified. So this is like automatically done by Tropy. Um, and up here I have the item metadata. So the photo metadata or the photo information is information like sort of like the technical specs of the image. And then the item information is a lot of the metadata that you are going to add to, you know, make this photo usable and make this photo searchable and everything. So you can very easily edit. You just click on whatever is the field that you want to add information to and you can just write it. Um, you also can create, uh, you know, you don't have to use this form that I have here. So here it says trophy generic. If I click on it, you're going to see that I have different templates and you can see that there's even one called Marcellus because I can actually create my own templates if I was using a schema that I had came up with or that my institution was working with. So I can actually create my own templates. There's two ways to do this. Um, I can use an existing, an existing template. And then if I right click on the uh, metadata or in the metadata, I can add a new field. So for example, I'm just gonna say location. I was gonna suggest um, a few things um, and I can just use that or I can just use whatever I want. So I can add metadata or I can add a field that way. Or I can actually even create my own um, my own um, template by going to uh, preferences, which we're gonna go in a second, but I see that we have a question. Um, yes, you can use Dublin Core. There, there is a Dublin Core one, so you can actually, you can definitely use Dublin Core um, metadata in Tropy. I would say it might be easier. So I strongly suggest that you use uh, Dublin Core, which is one of the um, ones that Tropy offers right away. But let's say you wanted to create your own template. Very easy, you go to edit. And then under edit, we go to preferences. Um, we're gonna take a look at everything on preferences later, but I want you to show here where it says templates and you would give your template a new name. So we're gonna say my template will be July 22, for example, and I can add, you know, who created it. So I'm just gonna put my initials and I can add a description and I click on create. And then you can just add your fields. So you're able to add your fields. So you'll select a property. There's quite a bit of them here. And then you can just create a template of your own. You can label, the, label them whatever you want. So if I were to choose one, um, I don't have to use the name of that property. Um, I can uh, just look at, you know, I can just like, name it something else. I say this, I'm saying uh, the TIFF picked an import. You know, I think that you, you might have some issues with TIFF images because I think I had the same issue. Try um, 
any other type file um, and we should be fine. Uh, we can look at it later if you if you want. Um, going back to our uh, trophy preferences and to create our own templates, as I was saying, the label, you can just give it the name that you want. You can add a hint and the hint will tell you, will tell someone else who's doing it or even remind yourself or what information is supposed to go in that field. And then the, this one I really like, it's called, this is called like default value. Let's say, and I know like some of you are working on collections and like all your, all your, like all, all, all your items will come from the same collection. Um, if you create a default value, that will be immediately like automatically populated into all your items without you having to actually do it yourself. So whenever you choose the meta, like, you know, that this template, it will automatically say, and let's say you have collection, so it will all be part of this collection. So it might help you, you know, do things a little bit quicker. Um, and you won't need to, to do that uh, every single time. And then once you're done, you can add more fields this way. And then once you're done, you just close it and you are good to go. Okay, I see you have a question. Um, I wonder if there's any way to automate the labeling of images in a computer so it does not have to individual rename or label all of them. Hmm, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, definitely not something you could do on Trophy. Um, but there might be some like, someone who knows coding better than I do that might know uh, other ways of, of doing it. So coming back to our uh, metadata and to Tropy. Um, so we looked at how to edit your metadata. You can use your templates. One thing I want to mention about the, uh, the built-in templates, um, so there's Dublin Core, and if you have worked in libraries or museums or archives or anything like that, you might be familiar with Dublin Core. Another one that I want to highlight is Tropy Correspondence, which is uh, specifically for letters. So if you are someone who's working with uh, letters or correspondence, uh, this is a format that they have created specifically for those types of documents. So just know that that is there for you. Okay, so we have our metadata which is great and then it's searchable. And I'll show you one where I have some more metadata, hopefully. So I, I built some more, I guess I did it. Um, I'm sorry for, I'm in the office and the um, there's a lot of people coming in and out of doors. Um, yes, Tropy is a tool to add metadata to your images. Yes, you are working and creating metadata for your files and then you can have, keep them organized and you can um, search them and work with them a lot easier than you would do it if you just had them as individual files. So a co really cool thing that uh, Tropy has is that you're able to tag your images so then you can very easily um, say what they're about, retrieve them really easily, kind of group them by tag or topic or anything like that. Um, you can see here that I have these red dots on these images and those are images that have been tagged with my tag, let's make this bigger here, with my tag food. So what I did is of all these academic conference memes that I got, I looked at everything, all of them, and those that were talking about food, I just, you know, tag them with food. So let's talk about how do how we tag things. Um, the first thing we need to do is we need to create our tags. Very, very easy. On the left pane, we're going to just right click or control click or command click if you're on a Mac. And then I can just create a new tag and give it a name. So our name here will be, um, I would say presentation slides because I know um, there are a few memes that talk about like the length of presentations and slides and things like that. So I have created my tag, so far so good. I can right click on the tag to give it a color. So I'm gonna make it purple, there we go. And then when I go here and all I need to do to add a tag is either drag and drop or right click on the um, on on the image. So for example, let's say um, this one says conclusion slide, so I know it's about slides. I can either just drag and drop it onto presenting the tag, and there it is. Or the other thing I can do, I'm we'll just go back here, is right click and then go to tags and just add my tag. So this is really handy if you want to sort of categorize your images. Um, 
as you're looking at them and you're able to retrieve them a lot, retrieve them a lot quicker and get uh, some organization that way. And I really like that they're color coded. So when I look at my list, I can very easily see which one belongs where. If I click on the tag, then I'm going to see all the um, images that are tagged that way. And very important, an image can have more than one tag. So there's no limit on how many tags you can add to an image. So if you have an image that is about both slides and food, you could do that and you could just have them um, be tagged with the two things. Okay, so we looked at our tags. So there's another way to organize your information, which are lists. Lists are like folders or groups of images that you put together. Um, these may be really handy if you have different parts of your project. So you wanna make sure that you're working, you know, with the different sets of images as you're working on this. Like with tags, you can have as many, um, so uh, an image can be part of multiple lists. You're not limited to that one. So I have, for example, here list number one, which is empty, but it's here. And we're going to create a list. We create a list the same way we created a tag. You right click on the left hand side pane and you just say a uh, new list. So I'm going to call this list number two. And to add things to my list, I can very easily drag and drop. I can select with control, I can select more than one and just again drag and drop it to my list. Or I can, um, no, I cannot do it this way. I was wrong. I was wrong. So you would just drag and drop to your uh, to the list that you want. Um, so when I mentioned before that you know Tropy doesn't really uh, respect file structure, this is something that you can do to create those structures within your document. You can create nestled lists, so a list can have other lists under it. Um, and this is where for me it's very reminiscent of the Zotero and Node if you've ever used those. Um, you can have your you know groups under groups. Same thing, you could create lists under lists if you want it and if it helped you or it helped your, your, your project. Okay, the last thing you're going to talk before we go to the item view is the searching. So I mentioned that it's super searchable that you can search. It searches all your tags or your notes, which we want to look at in a minute. It searches for everything that is on the um, on the metadata. And you can use search here. And the cool thing is that you can search using Boolean operators. So Booleans are and, or, and not. And you can also use quotation marks to search for a phrase. So it's really, really good in that sense. So for example, let's say I'm interested in things about coffee, um, but not things that talk about tea. I could do coffee, not tea. And then it's going to remove the one that I know that talks about tea. Let me just do that again, but I'll, I'll make the images bigger so you can get a better idea. So I have these two images uh, that showed up when I searched for coffee. And then I say, coffee, not tea, and then it's just gonna give me one. Okay, so have, we have a question here um, that says, um, the, yeah, your, what would you um, have your images? Your images will be stored in your computer. Yes, you, but you will make them searchable um, through here. So you would have the images stored on your computer or in the, on the cloud, and then you would be using this to search those images. You just need that connection between Tropy and your images that is established when you um, w when you create a Tropy project and we when you add your files. Okay. So now that we have done this and we looked at the uh, the project view, let's take a look at the item views and some of the things that you can do when you are um, working with a specific um, item. So. This is the item view. All I did was double click on one of the files or one of the one of the items. And you can see here I have my metadata. I can edit my metadata here with no problem. Um, on the top here, you can see we have some basic editing. So I can, you know, mirror the image, I can rotate it, I can do a few things. And then over here. Usually you will see it like this. If you click, there's like the uh, sliding thingy. Um, you can do some more edits in terms of brightness and contrast. This is really useful if you have 
maybe something that you digitize that's a bit older and that you want to make it more legible so you can play around with this to make it more legible. Um, one thing that's very important to know is at the end of that filter, it says revert, oh, sorry, of those editing functions, it says revert to original. If you do that, everything you do will be lost. So just please know that. Don't do it unless you will know you want to do it. Um, so any edits that you did here or here, everything will go back to the original, original, original. Not the last changes that you made, but the original. So just keep that in mind. Um, then you have your um, selection tool, which we're going to look at in a minute. So let's say I have an image like this one, and there's something that I want to highlight. I can use the little square over here at the top. And we can use this square to create a selection of that image. So in this case, um, I select. I, I, I had a moment where it was like, is this Daphne? Yes, she's Daphne. So I selected Daphne from the Scooby-Doo meme. And when I do that, I create a selection. And from here, I can maybe add some meta, metadata specifically to this part of the image, not to the entire image. I can describe, uh, for example, I can describe Daphne in detail or what she's doing or anything like that in detail. Um, so this is really useful if there was something in an image that you want to highlight, that you want to make into its own thing, um, or something that, you know, as you know that in the future you would like to make sure that you know that there's something special about this part of the image. Um, and you can also make it into your own image if you click you right click, it says export selection. You can create it into, you can make it into its own file as well. So then you could have two separate files, but I really like the nestle way you have it here. So you could view it like in context. So for me, that's really useful. The last thing we're gonna look at in the item view is are the notes, um, which I showed here, I have some. So notes allow to you to, as the name says, take notes on the um, about the image. You can have as many notes as you want. Like you can see here, I have decided to create two notes. The first one is just you know the transcription of the text that is on my image, and then the second one is a description of what you can see on the image. Um, there are different ways of doing it, but just know that you know you can add your notes. You can have as many as you want, and when you search that metadata, it's going to search the notes as well. So. If you're, you know, if you're mindful as when you're writing them and you make sure that, you know, like you, you're descriptive enough, then things will be, will pop up when you are searching it. Um, and since I talked about notes, um, let's talk a little bit about just, uh, Alyssa was really great and she talked a lot about um, best practices and metadata and things like that. I wanted to talk two seconds about image descriptions um, and, a few things that I find relevant and important. Um, so there are different ways, there are, there are different types of image descriptions. Uh, we talk about alt text, which is an explanation of an image that's usually used, well, it's not usually, it's actually always used um, in digital formats. It's used um, to add uh, a description of the image that is not seen. You cannot see the alt text if you're just looking at an image um, on a computer, but it's embedded in the code. So someone who is using a screen reader or if the image is not displaying, you will see a description of that image in there. We also have image descriptions, which are detailed explanations that provide uh, textual access to visual content. They're usually used for digital graphics, online digital files, and you can actually use it as alt text. We use them as alt text as well, but they're not always used as alt text. And then the last one are captions, which are brief explanations that go with an image. They are not necessarily descriptive. They actually may sometimes may add more context to the image or help you understand the image better. What we're going to be working on or what we're talking about those notes um, or image description is that that middle one where we talk about like, you know, we're describing the image and what you can see in there. As I said, sometimes that image can be used as alt text, but you know, you could also have multiple notes who are alt text in there. And then since we're talking about image description, I wanted to highlight something that's really known in the archives world and the library world. Um, and it's called mindful or inclusive description. And a lot of companies are doing, I pull excerpts here from a, the Center for Early Modern Visual Culture who runs Kern and also from uh, a group 
a working group at the Princeton, U Princeton University Libraries um, where we are choosing the words that we use to describe images carefully. And that means that we are choosing to use the names, uh, uh, to name people by the names they want to be called themselves and not what maybe they were called in the past. Um, so for example, um, here at Kern, let's say, we refer to the invention of the Americas as, of, to the invention, the, uh, rather than conquest, we refer to the invention of the Americas as resulting in genocide. Girls, when referring to adults, is replaced with women, and indigenous groups are properly and respectfully listed uh, using the names that they have embraced. Um, so something to think about as you're working on those descriptions, as, as you're deciding how to describe your images, thinking about, you know, what words are you using? Um, and are the words that I'm choosing to use perpetuating harm or perpetuating stereotypes um, that have, you know, harmed communities in uh, you know, for, 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 for ages? So just something to keep in mind. We're gonna go back to tropey. Okay. So the last thing I'm, I'll mention here on the notes side is that two things. Number one is, if you don't like this way of looking at it and would like to see like the notes like more like side to side, you can do this. If you right click and you click on view layout and you see side by side, so you would see like the image and next the note. It's it's just how your brain works better. It, there's no benefit to this. It's more like how you would rather do it. Um, yeah, it's really up to you. It's just how you like to do it, to, to look at it. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, I. I don't know, I'm used to this one, so I like this one, but it's really up to you. And then if for any reason you would like your lines numbered, you can do that as well. If you right click and you show line numbers, um, you can have line numbers. Um, this might not be useful for most of you, but some of you may find it useful. So I just wanted to make sure that I got to um, show it to you so that you are able to use it. So last couple of things that I wanna show you uh, about Tropy, which I actually labeled on in my notes, other stuff. Uh, the first one is that you can print your records. So um, if you go to file and click on print, you can send it to print. And I actually have one over here. So I'll show you one in my computer, just how it looks like. Um, so what you get is you get the, um, you're gonna get the image. So I'll make sure that you are seeing what I think you're seeing. Yes. So you're gonna get the image and then below you get all the metadata that you added, your notes, everything. So if there's something that you want to print out, something that you can do. You can also export your um, your tags. So just know that you could export your tags as a CSV file. And speaking of exporting, uh, you can export your Tropy libraries. Um, uh, or your Tropy projects, I would say. There's different ways you can export them. So the two that are like the, the built-in built -in are, if you go to Excel file export is JSON or PDF. So these are the two ways you can export your, your Tropy project. However, I mentioned before, there are a bunch of plugins that you can download. So for example, the one I have here is this one, it's called the CSV one that will allow me to export my metadata um, as a CSV file. I'll show you in a second um, how you can do that. Uh, let me show you some of the other. So there's a CSV one. There's one from Omeka S. I do wonder if it works with the other Omekas. Omeka S is something that um, universities and museums usually have, but I wonder if it would work with the other Omeka. There's the archive version. And if I'm not mistaken, the archive version uh, includes the images and the metadata. So depending on what you need to do, that might be something really useful. There's the IIF, and then there's one that also, there's a plugin also that works with Zotero, uh, which is the citation management system. Um, all of them can be found on GitHub. We're gonna send you the slides in a little bit, so you'll be able to just click, but they're all on GitHub, and I'll show you how you um, install them on uh, Tropy. So before we went to preferences to get new templates, we're gonna go to preferences again, and then you go to plugins and you click on install plugin. And you're just gonna upload the zip file that you download from GitHub, and that's all you need to do. One thing that happened to me was that when I first did it for the CSV file, it um, it kept giving me an error, so I had to close Tropy and open it again after I had installed it. So I recommend that you do that um, in there. 
so that you're able to do that. So I'd recommend that you close it and open it again once you uh, install a new plugin and then you can disable them or install them, whatever you want. So it's very easy. And since we are here on preferences, we looked at the templates before. Um, vocabularies are different um, metadata, like metadata schema or, you know, structures that already exist. Um, they have like, I would say most of the main ones, but you could check and clear out another one if, if you want it. Um, and then just the last thing I want to show you before we go to questions or anything like that are the um, a few things I can do under settings. Um, so the first one is you can tell Tropy what to do with duplicate photos. So you can ask them to just skip them. So to not add photos that have the same name as the um, photos that you already have. You can tell it to accept duplicate photos. And that means that like when you add new pictures, even if they're already there, it will add them, you just have duplicates. Or you can ask it to ask you every time. So if the trophy finds a duplicate, it will say, hey, these two seem to be the same images. What should I do with it? The other thing I wanna mention under theme, if you are someone who likes the dark theme, you can do that as well. Uh, here, you can change the language uh, of Tropy. They don't have that many options, but if you speak, German, Spanish, uh, French, Italian, I want to say Mandarin, Portuguese, and I'm assuming in Japanese, you can actually do it. Um, if not, just stick to English, but you just know that you can change the um, uh, the, the the language of Tropy, and that's pretty much it. There's a few other things that you can do, but nothing really uh, that will be earth shattering. So that has been a Tropy in a nutshell, and we are now more than happy to take on your questions. Let me just uh, stop sharing. Okay, and then for the person, I think um, I think we got to all the ones in the chat so far for the person who asked about making images public. Um, so I think Marcella addressed the metadata size so you could export that CSV and then you would deposit that along with the images themselves as individual files or as you know, part of a folder, if that makes sense. I'm gonna put a link to, I just quickly looked in the McGill, like in the McGill Dataverse for if someone has published data with images. And so you can see what it might look like. Um, they don't have necessarily like a trophy output with it, but just if you wanna see what it looks like to have a published data set that's of images. Um, and Marcella is sharing the PowerPoint slides with everyone. Thanks Marcella, I had it ready to go and forgot. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. It's good teamwork. Um, <laughs> any okay. other questions to Eliza, to me, uh, about anything regarding images? Um, okay. okay, so this time it works. It's yes. really, I would say it's really up to you. Like if you are someone who's very organized and you want to have all your images very well organized, then that's great. Like I would say if I was doing research that was very image heavy, I would want to have something like this so that I can pull things really quickly and not have to, you know, go digging through my images. I know that I can just go search them and find them. That's me. Uh, but, you know, I just let you know, like I actually, one of the questions that we get quite, quite often at the Digital Scholarship Hub is how to organize your own personal images. So I think sort of for certain people, this would be a great way to organize their own personal images. Um, so I think it's a lot of it is, it's up to you and what works best for you uh, as a researcher, but also in terms of like, are you a browser? Are you a searcher? I think that might also uh, make a difference. And I think the machine readable metadata, like the schemes and the standards, those are more for like making it shareable through interoperable systems, right? So like letting systems talk to each other in a standard way. Um, so it is really for that idea of like publishing it or making them available in some way. Um, and part of the reason we're discussing that is that even if I mean, there are cases where you like can't share them. You have like a third party contract or you have a legal obligation or something. Um, but in, in certain cases, if you're funded, if your research is funded and there's an expectation in your discipline that those data will be available, then it's a, a way to package it so that other researchers can find it. Um, for your own personal use, there's some basic metadata that you might wanna have as Marcella said, just to be efficient. And also if you come back in 10 years and you're like, did I take this photo or, you know, like, did my 
like, pe- did my grad student take this photo? Or like, what is this of? What project is this related to? So just even thinking about like the file name itself and like having some description somewhere of like why you are naming files in a certain way. It's just, you know, it is technically that kind of metadata that can be useful to yourself. Uh, I rambled a bit. I got a direct question about Tropy. Can Tropy import images in different formats? Um, yes. Not every format, though. There's a there, there are specific uh, formats that it can work with. I think with uh, I think with TIFF, I was having an issue too um, a couple of days ago. So I I don't want to lie and say it doesn't. But yeah, there you can. It has different formats. I know it does JPEG, JPG, PNG, uh, but it's not all formats. Just so so we know. And it's um, I wish it did a video too, but it doesn't. So. Um, what I'm going to do before we do that is I'm going to stop the recording and if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions that way, we, we can do that. So um, if you're watching on us on YouTube, thank you for watching and uh, we'll post more workshops soon. <laughs>